Well, now, what happened from then on, um, the external story is not particularly interesting, and that's been covered well by the Saturday Evening Post. The internal story is, is what I want to talk to you about, because from that point on, I changed the whole course of my actions. First, I tried to find ways within the system, within the establishment, within the scientific community, to work with these things, to work with the concepts or the variables that I was arriving at. We started to work with game theory and the game model and try to conceive of that non-game point, which is not a point of action, from which you observe or you are aware of the roles, rules, rituals, language and strategy and so on that are involved in games. And Tim was applying this in the prisons and I was applying it in the school systems. And I was teaching in junior high school a, a hip counseling course in the, for the Newton eighth grade kids in the Newton school system based on game theory or how to change your own behavior through an analysis of your own social games. Do it yourself, kid, for behavior change. And then because I realized there was something that was quite nonverbal about it, into the Lexington school system, I had introduced karate not as karate, I mean, the parents wouldn't go for that, but the kids subtly knew it was, and we called it on the paper Methods of Eastern Exercise. <laughs> and I was teaching the kids, or I had the karate instructors teaching the kids how to focus on a point and clear their mind in order to be able to be aware of all the stimuli around them, all of which was helping them become free of their entrapment in moment-to-moment -moment stimuli from the outside. Well, as you all know, it was all too hot to handle, and um, I got thrown out of Harvard, and uh, we continued our work in a variety of communities in Mexico, the Caribbean, Millbrook, Newton. I went on to California. Now, in the course of the next six years, to be quite brief about it, I uh, ingested LSD or mescaline or peyote or oliuqui or DMT or DET or STP or whatever else I can recall at the moment. Whatever was offered to me, I took. Something in excess of probably 300 times. And I still came down. No matter how many times I went up, I always came down. It was as if I would go to the doorway, I would look in, and maybe for a brief moment I would be able to experience this other kind of consciousness. And I'd always think, well, now I've got it forever. I'll, oh, I'll never have to go back to that place. I remember vividly uh, one experience in the meditation room in Newton where I had um, taken a very sizable dose of, of LSD and I had, was alone and I had meditated for many hours, fasted and so on, and I went into a state of samadhi for a timeless period. I think it was probably about two hours, but I don't know because it didn't have much time is not a variable in that state. And then I remember starting to come out of it. And what I saw was coming down the room a huge blood red wave rolling towards me like an ocean wave. And in it were all the components of my identity. I saw myself on a tricycle as a little boy, I remember vividly. I saw all of these different images of different takes getting out of the bathtub or you know, any moment when I'd ever been conscious in my life. It was like a Hieronymus Bosch painting. That's the, the feeling it had. And I remember holding my arms up to ward it off and saying, no, I don't want to go back into that. And it was as if I realized at that moment I didn't have the key, I didn't have the leverage to be able to avoid going back into that thing. I didn't seem to be able... I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to, what to recite to keep this demon from, you know, taking me over again. 
and I felt it rolling over me, and then I was back as in my social identity. Now I tried everything. I got together with four other people, and we locked ourselves in a house for three weeks, and we took LSD, 400 micrograms of LSD, every four hours for three weeks. That's like 2,200 micrograms a day. And it was a ball. We had a wonderful time for three weeks, I'll tell you. We did all kinds of sculpture with, and, and metal welding and painting, and we had many internal mind trips together. And at the end of the three weeks, when we came out of the house, we all came down. Right. Now, it isn't that I wasn't changing all this time. A lot was going on. Each of these, see, I did a lot of what you call program trips. That is, I would work with a chemical to design a plan for an experience in order to confront me with certain stimuli to get me to change my habits of thought about that particular thing. Because I knew that that was what was involved. It was changing one's whole cognitive map, if you will. But there was a very subtle quality, a problem involved in here, and it had been pointed out to me by none other than an Eastern mystic by the name of Meher Baba, who uh, during a period of time I had become very devoted to. And the story of Meher Baba, I can briefly tell that my part of it is this, that I was living with Steve Durkee and his wife and child and, and uh, Jane Burton and her baby, and we were in a community in California in a big house in Los Altos. Steve is a mystic artist. Steve and Barbara were from the USCO group here in the East with Gerd Stern, and they all were followers of Meher Baba. And we were all living in Los Altos, taking LSD together. And Meher Baba sent a message through a boy that went to visit him. He held up, he was silent, and he held up his hand and he went, nay, meaning stop smoking that horrible stuff. So the message came back, Maya Baba said to stop smoking that horrible stuff. Well, I interpreted that as, well, he's telling this young hippie, whoever he is, that it's not good for him. It has nothing to do with me. And then the next thing I heard was that Maya Baba had sent somebody back to the United States, in fact, this fellow, to tell all of the Baba lovers to stop taking LSD and stop having anything to do with anybody who took LSD. Well, now, this raised a peculiar problem for us in our home because Steve and Barbara were followers of Meher Baba, and I was one of the LSD people, as we were called, and we were going to have to break up the community in order to adhere to his uh, directions. So I wrote Meher Baba a letter. It's a strange thing to write a letter to somebody who says, I am God, I am the avatar, but I, you know... <laughs> I took courage in hand, and I wrote and I said, Maya Baba, here is my problem, <laughs> which you undoubtedly already know, but I'll tell it to you on paper anyway. Um, I read your books, and they all speak to me from way inside myself. I know they're all true. It all feels absolutely right. The only reason I know that is because of these drugs. Therefore, how can I, with any integrity, put them down since they brought me to you? Would you please tell me how to do this? So he wrote back and he said, in effect, for a few serious students like yourself, these chemicals may be slightly helpful. You may take them three more times and then you should stop. <laughs> I thought that was very funny, but... The other thing he said was, he said, there is a, the problem is that one gets addicted to the experience. Not addicted to the drug, addicted to the experience. What I now would call, you get trapped in your upaya. You get trapped in your method. And the person who says, well, I'll just take it once more to go back to that place. Maybe this time I can stay. Already knows he's not going to be able to stay this time. And he knows, just like I knew, that somewhere inside of himself is a little voice saying, which is the drug and which is me? 
although he's, he's putting down anybody that's saying, man, it's all hallucination, and you ought to settle down and live in reality, because he already knows that it... See, the drugs did the major thing for me, is they broke through my limited reality that I had considered absolute reality, like this is the way the world is, and it introduced me to relative reality, so I could get outside a particular perspective and see that there were other realities as well. I got... I got into rel relative values, relative perspective, relative reality. The next step, as I'm going to tell you about in a moment, takes you the next step, which goes behind the relative realities to, again, to an absolute reality, to a, a capital T truth, which science, of course, says there isn't. And it was true that I was addicted to the experience because when I would come back into this consciousness, it was as if I just didn't have the, the effectiveness, the free energy, the powers of consciousness, the understanding of the universe that I had when I was under these chemicals. And therefore, I used these chemicals any time I would be required to perform at a very high level of consciousness which made it very difficult to go out on lecture tours and keep from getting busted. <laughs> Whoever hears this. <laughs> okay. 1966, seven, two things happened. One is a mounting degree of despair in me. It's not what you would call drug depression, by any means. I realize that these drugs are just what we always thought they were. They are the powerful vehicle that show the possibility. But I realize that we don't know enough to figure out how to use them. And nobody else seems to either. I mean, everybody you talk to, I, we were talking to the people who supposedly knew. And none of them had a model which would allow us to really stay in these situations. Situation. The other thing that happened to me was that um, I had been invited as one of the initial people before any, it was released into the market to experiment with this chemical called STP. And the dosage I was given turned out to be uh, about twice as large as is feasible to work with. And um, it had put me into a strange uh, timeless glass in case booth for about three days, during which I had to deliver a lecture at a university since I had not expected that the chemical was going to last that long. And I was delivered to this university <laughs> and on to the lectern, not onto the platform. And I took microphone in hand and this um, voice spoke through me and I proceeded to give a lecture. And at the end of the lecture, there was a very curious reaction on the part of the audience, because when the lecture was all over, nobody moved. And I said, well, that's all, everybody. Nothing happened. Nobody moved. And then people came up, and they stood around, and nobody said anything. They just stood there. I stood there, and they stood there. I'm giving you a behaviorist description of it now. And a friend of mine that was there said that the people that had just come out of curiosity who couldn't appreciate or accept the feelings that I was projecting had become so uptight and angry that she said it was the first time she ever feared for my physical safety at a lecture, that these people would have physically hurt me if they could have because I got to something in them so deep. 
Well, I sensed at that point that whatever else these chemicals were, they had opened something in me that I wasn't the least bit ready to be responsible for, since I didn't think I was a responsible enough being to be in this position of whatever uh, was being called out here. It was like uh, you were handing uh, a jet controls to a, to a child. I mean, you know, that's, it's insane to give me those kind of powers when I was so power hungry, as my previous uh, life had demonstrated. And so I canceled all my lectures at that point, deciding I couldn't really afford to speak anymore since I didn't know what was going on. Now, the final um, thread bringing you to the third part of the story is that in uh, the early 60s, when we first started to work on this with people like Aldous Huxley and Gerald Hurd and uh, many advisors and wise friends, they had brought to our attention many Eastern books as being relevant and the Tibetan Book of the Dead, which was a manual used in Tibet to prepare people, read by monks to a person as he was dying to prepare him to die and go through the 49 days before reincarnation through the Bardos, that when we looked over that book, that book was almost at times frighteningly parallel to the psychedelic experience. And therefore, Tim conceived of and pretty much did on his own the translation of that, of Evans Wentz's translation of the Tibetan book into a manual for working with the psychedelics. We tried to conceive of the psychedelic experience as a psychological death-rebirth experience, since uh, my own first experience was such a death experience, as I pointed out to you. And following that, we read a number of books which had led us to believe that the information that we needed to know to socialize these chemicals for to be able to work with these higher states of consciousness was known in the East by somebody at some time or other. And so various of us went to India to look, find these guys, you know, go find one of them. And everybody came back with the same report, well, I guess there aren't any around, they're all gone. And it got frighteningly clear that there might be a possibility that we knew as much as anybody knew that was alive, and we didn't know. <laughs> right? And that was a very uh, unpleasant feeling to have, <laughs> because that made it all a little too irresponsible, whoever was planning it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, in 19, early uh, beginning of 67, I had used up all my alternatives. I had seen that the LSD, the way I understood it, wasn't going to take me where I wanted to go. I, there was no sense in continuing just to turn on because I knew I would go to this wonderful place and that was a groove, but that wasn't enough. And I didn't know what to do next. And I couldn't really, I read all these books from the East, but they didn't do it for me. I, I, it was, the words were, you know, they were all, all that foreigner stuff. <laughs> I was in the ethnocentric predicament. <clears throat> well, I finally uh, decided that I would go to India and look for myself. Maybe they'd overlooked a, a holy man hanging out somewhere. And I had a friend, um, David Padua, who's a, a, a very uh, intellectual, extraordinary fellow and who has retired at 35 after uh, being very successful in his undertakings. And so uh, he arranged for a Land Rover to be delivered to Tehran and we started our journey from Tehran, Iran, in search of the Sufis, which were the the mystics of Islam. And we looked 
we searched out Sufis, and all we found was one Sufi about 92 who was blind and was very sweet and gentle and surrounded by very lovely people, but nothing happened. I mean, you, the way you get to know is somewhere in here. You, there's nothing they're going to say to you. There's nothing they're going to... Uh, they, they don't have a badge or a credential or anything. It's just you're going to feel that something happened. And then we went on through Afghanistan, which is an extraordinarily beautiful country. And um, in a haze of extraordinarily fine uh, charis, hashish, went on through India. Went to see the Dalai Lama. Dharamsala had his audience, Darshan. <coughs> got horses and went up to, Ma, to uh, Amarnath Cave up in Kashmir, a uh, religious pilgrimage of many days, with some beautiful girls we'd met, meeting these holy men along the way who we'd exchange a pipe with, you know, we'd enjoy a pipe together, all smiling at one another. But I didn't know. It was a big cave, and it was lovely. It was a nice horse ride. But nothing happened inside me. And then we went to um, Benares, the holy city where the burning ghats are. And that scared me very much because there were all these old people waiting to die. And I took LSD and walked down the streets and was afraid to look any of them in the face because they were all so much there. And I couldn't, I still had travel's checks. <laughs> you know. I was holding back. I was playing my game. Well, on we went for three months or so, and my despair was increasing. And we got to Kathmandu, Nepal, and we had had a delightful journey. I mean, it was really delightful as journeys go. You know, we had our guide, our friend and companion was. Harish Johari, who was a very, very fine Indian sculptor, uh, the son of a yogi, a very uh, gentle, beautiful person who uh, understands Indian music from the most uh, delicate point of view. And he was just a fine person to be with. Well, there we were in Kathmandu, Nepal, and we were then going on to Japan the time we were going to join Alan Watts in Kyoto. And I was really depressed. It might have been all the hashish I had smoked, but I don't think it was just that. What it was in addition was the feeling that I had looked and nothing had happened. I didn't find anything. <coughs> We were staying at a very fancy hotel owned by the Prince of Nepal, the Sawalti. And one day, I, David and I walked into the square, and we were sitting in a, a restaurant called the Blue Tibetan, which is a hippie hangout, sitting with some beautiful French, young French hippies. Now, I had been going around India giving LSD to holy men. You see, I was hoping to find out what LSD was or maybe get some clues as to what to do with it by finding, say, an old Theravadan monk or a uh, Kajipa Lama or a uh, Shaivite uh, Sadhu. And I would say, would you, I'd explain, you know, through a, a translator or whatever vehicle we had, and they would, could, could they try it? Yeah, here it is, and, you know, and some of them, you know, there were some of these holy people who, oh, wow, isn't this a ball? You know, this is just great. And others said it gave me a headache, and others said, well, it's not as good as meditation, and others, everybody, it gave, they gave as much variability as any Western subject sample would do. And the problem was that all in each of them, I felt ego. In other words, I didn't get a feeling from any of them that they were themselves realized beings. They were all on the journey. They were all looking. 
they all had their little hand out for the pills so fast that I knew they were still looking, <laughs> if you know what I mean. <laughs> so we're sitting in the blue Tibetan, And in walks this very unusual looking fellow. He's a Westerner, he's from the United States, young fellow. Perhaps he's so unusual because he's very tall. He's six foot seven, long beard, long hair, blonde hair. Looks a little like Christ. White cloth, barefoot. Walked in and very commanding type person, young looking. Walked right over to our table and sat down. And we all continued to talk, and he said a few things. And David and I sensed almost immediately that this fellow was very, you, you know, he was a Westerner, yes, and the, all the hippies were dressed in holy robes of one sort or another. So that wasn't unusual. But there was something about this guy that was different from all these others. There was something that felt different. So we sort of uh, collared him and brought him back to our hotel, sort of as a, you know, something to, you know, we'd examine him. <laughs> and it's tough sneaking those people through the lobby of these fancy <laughs> hotels. <you know? laughs> but we got up into our suite and then we had about five days of a, sort of a, a seminar made up of Charis and peach melbas and hot baths and Alexandra David Neal books and Avalon, Richard Avedon books, Avedon books, Arthur Avedon. And um, LSD. And the deeper we all got into, there were the four of us, this Indian sculptor, David, who's really a Buddhist at heart <laughs> or in, in mind or in mindlessness, although still very much caught in the world of the external world, but sees what the possibility is intellectually. Extraordinary intellect. He went to college when he was 14 and he had his international law degree when he was 20 and, you know, that kind of person. <coughs> And uh, this uh, tall fellow and me. And as the days went on, it became apparent that while all the rest of us were still looking at one level or another, this tall guy knew there was a different feeling. Inside, there was somebody in there. There was something very certain. You didn't feel that he was reaching so hard. You still felt his personality, but it was a different quality about him. Something different. And he knew an awful lot about a lot of things. He had left the United States when he was 17 years old. He just finished high school and he, he was an extraordinary guitarist. He thumbed his way across the United States, went on a freighter to Rotterdam and then playing his guitar all the way across Africa and Egypt and Israel and all, came to India. He knew he was home and he had been initiated into a number of different sects and he had been in India for uh, four years then. And he knew a great deal, knew a great deal. So when it came time for us to leave for Japan, I didn't really want to go because this was the first guy that was the spark of the light that I was looking for, but it seemed absurd that I would come, what, 6,000 miles or something like that, and uh, on this journey to find a 23-year-old uh, guy from Laguna Beach. I mean, it just, you know, it, it was very hard just from a, a uh, altering one's expectations. And so I got to this choice point of going on with David first class, the rest of the, our survey of the Eastern Oriental mind, <laughs> the Oriental mind survey. 
uh, or going off with this tall fellow who was going to go on a religious pilgrimage in India, back into India. Well, I chose to go with him. Well, that was quite a drastic experience for me. I've always had kind of a soft life. And I suddenly found myself walking out of Calcutta barefoot. He had given away all of my stuff. <laughs> he had taken over all of my money. Most of it he had given away already. I had a, a shoulder bag and a little Tibetan drum. And my feet were all blistered. Previously, I had been in the Land Rover where we had a big suitcase full of entraviaform and oreomycin and all of these nice things. And now my shoulder bag had a tube of Johnson First Aid Cream and two Band-Aids. That was my whole equipment. And previously we were drinking bottled this and going to American-style restaurants. And, and now I was eating from street vendors. And uh, so the dysentery was quite extraordinary, in which case he would say to me, well, a fast would be good. Right? I mean, he was compassionate, but there was no pity. <laughs> no pity. He wasn't climbing into the western. Oh, you. Oh, oh. You know what? Here, lie down. Um, blisters. Well, we'll walk slower. <laughs> That's quite a thing for him to walk, because the streets, you see, because cows are sacred. The cows leave their dung, and before they're picked up and made into fuel, they're hanging around. And then all these people are chewing pan in India and spitting the pan juice. And I had come out of, you know, excessively good toilet training. <laughs> and to walk, I was so exhausted from the end of the day of having to see where I was walking. 